Hello everybody. I'm very sorry not to be in Hawaii for this year's SEALs. I'm not travelling at all outside of Australia these days. Nonetheless, we are able to meet virtually and today I'm discussing grammaticalization in Nicobarese. So the background is that uniquely amongst Austroasiatic languages, Nicobarese uh, lects are spoken by small island communities. Two languages, uh, Ka and Nankauri, are usefully documented. Uh, Ka is in the north of the archipelago. It has the largest population and the language has been actively used in written form for over a century. Nankauri reflects the speech of the central island group. And it also appears that the southern island lects are also quite close to Nankauri except perhaps for Champagne, for which we have little useful documentation. So the big grammar picture, ka strictly verb initial. There is obligatory agreement marking on verbs with uh, lexical subjects or agents. There's numerous suffixes marking manner of action on verbs. There's a large paradigm of case marked personal and demonstrative pronouns. And there are two broad prepositions, one with a spatial temporal locus and another one with a general to towards benefactive type sense. And these prepositions do all the prepositional phrase work. Nankauri it's a similar but different. It has pragmatically variable word order, but there is a preference for verb initial. Um, there is no agreement marking on verbs, but there is a kind of ergative marking for animate arguments. This is something very different to car. There are numerous suffixes marking manner of action on verbs. The pronoun paradigm, it resembles a conservative Austroasiatic type, so it doesn't have all the kind of case marked forms that Carr has. And Nankauri has more prepositions, although what exactly counts as a preposition mm, is debatable. Now, both languages have a very weak noun verb distinction. In fact, I would say there's just one open class that can take uh, the verb position or a noun position. Um, and this is common to both languages. Now, the etymology problem, the thing which really concerns me, is that it's very difficult to reconstruct the proto Nicobarese lexicon beyond a couple of hundred roots. There's been a lot of word loss through taboo replacement and a lot of new lexicon generated from the existing roots by multiple layers of affixation. Uh, have a quick look at the uh, seven examples here from Nankauri of derived forms from the Austroasiatic root goin, meaning a male or husband. Now, very usefully, Radhakrishnan about 50 years ago internally reconstructed the Nankari lexicon, pulling apart all these uh, affixes and stems for many hundreds of words. Um, although he did it without wider reference to Austroasiatic, so um, that work uh, can be improved. Um, unfortunately, no similar study for car has been done, but car word formation follows similarly to Nankari. So we have quite a head start here. Now I've put up a table here. Um, this is just a selection of comparative Nankauri and Ka uh, grammatical morphemes which appear to be cognate. Um, in fact the fuller list I could give you is four times as long. Um, but as you can see just looking at this list many grammatical morphemes have evident Austroasiatic origins. Uh, and some we have no idea, some of them we have some speculative ideas. 
We're going to run through four today, which you see highlighted here. There's two um, uh, affixes and uh, two uh, preposition type uh, forms. Uh, and we're going to run through them now. And uh, ultimately, um, I want to present a, a kind of working paper where I present uh, the more complete list um, so this can be discussed and we can get some, some feedback on this. But we'll just look at four examples today to give you a, a teaser of what, what's going on. So the first one I've, you can see here is this uh, possessive u suffix. Both languages, uh, possession is typically marked just by concatenating the possessed and the possessor with no special morphology, um, except for pronouns in car. However, nouns denoting possessed things can be derived from nouns and verbs with the u suffix, uh, which also has some uh, allophony in, in car, which is given there. Um, I have some sentence examples for car. Unfortunately, I don't have any sentence examples for Nankari, given the limitations of the literature, but let's just quickly go through them. So in the two examples we have um, I have something to request. You see the request has the u suffix on it and now it means something possessed. Uh, in the next sentence, don't you have anything to cook? The cook verb has the u suffix and now it becomes something to cook. Um, Nankauri, there are numerous examples in Radhakrishnan's etymological lexicon such as uh, skiamu, thing that has an edge. Ihon u, one who has a beard. Ganu, one who is married, literally has a female. So I propose that we can derive this uh, straightforwardly from an Austroasiatic morpheme u, which I reconstruct is a kind of pronoun meaning he or it. And you can see here there are reflexes right across Austroasiatic um, with uh, meanings that indicate this kind of reconstruction. And I think it's, it's unremarkable that you have a, uh, a possessive that comes about by just putting the word for thing after the relevant verb. All right, that's an easy one. Okay, another easy one. So the form gui, meaning head, in Austroasiatic uh, has reflexes in Aslian, um, Katuic and elsewhere, meaning head or person, and we reconstruct head. Um, it's the regular word for head in Ka and in Nankauri, but also has grammatical meanings. Uh, the first example there, we just see um, word maker through dirt on her head. No problem. The other two we see GUI used as some kind of adverb or arguably a preposition, but I would say it's some sort of adverbial. Um, I dare you to jump across this well. So it's literally dare you, I, you jump head that water. So here, head means something like over, above, across. A fairly normal kind of grammaticalization. The next one, go and get my toe, go and get my comb on the table. Literally, go comb my you towards head of table. So it's something like on the table, but is it a preposition or is it a an adverb? Is it existing there above the table? Right. We don't have uh, an existential verb in car. So, and also we have the use of the E preposition here. So I would argue these are not quite full prepositions. They're adverbials on the way to being prepositions. Something similar in Nankari, but I think it's more grammaticalized. 
So in man's dictionary, we have many examples of uh, gui head, meaning also the summit or surface, or in many derived forms, meaning the, the top of some or front of something. Uh, we have these example sentences from Radhakrishnan. So put it on the table, literally um, put it and then gui mesa, mesa is the Portuguese word for table, it's a borrowing. Uh, and it has this da linka, which is a morpheme that uh, occurs frequently in Nankari, which it links or introduces clausal adjuncts, direct objects, indirect objects. There's a whole grammar to it that we don't need to discuss here. Similarly, sit on the tree, so literally sit, da, gui, tree. It looks like it's further down the line of grammaticalizing as a, as a preposition, meaning on or above, that kind of thing. So these are fairly straightforward examples. Let's have a look at some more problematic examples. So we have uh, in Nankari and Ka, we have reflexes of the Austroasiatic word for hand, which we reconstruct as D. It's day in Nankari and D in Ka. And they're both regular words for hand in those languages, but they also have grammatical meanings. So from Raja Singh, how many children do you have? Literally, interrogative, children, hand, you, marked as human subject. This is this ergative thing I was alluding to earlier. So how do we, tra how do we translate this? The, the glossing is with or instrumental in Raja Singh. Um, and I think that's that's fair enough. Uh, Radha Krishnan, we have an example. Uh, it is good to write with literally good hand, subordinating particle, write. Again, if we translate it as with, it makes sense. In the next one, uh, he was beaten by you. So past beat. He, hand, you. Well, the English translation is, is passive. I don't think passive works as a category for, um, for Nicobrese languages where we have this more or less fixed initial verb order. But if we translate it or gloss it with by or with, it makes sense. So we have this general kind of with or instrumental meaning and we can see that hand as the um, quintessential instrument is an obvious source for this kind of thing. Now, oddly, in car, we, in brains grammar, which is my main source, we don't find these constructions discussed. In fact, the closest thing to it is a single example where the word for face is glossed as with or by. And that's an odd example, which I would challenge. Um, let's go to the next slide. So in fact, in car, this um, morpheme meaning face, it's a regular word for face, gu, seems to come from an Austroasiatic uh, item meaning body. It does have grammatical meanings, um, but not I, I would challenge the instrumental characterization that brain gave it. So first of all, there's a straightforward meaning front. So in this, that is a tortoise in front of us. So literally tortoise that locative face us, right? So front or facing, this is the regular kind of grammaticalization for face. But now here's the really interesting thing. In the next four examples from uh, Carr, we have face. It looks like some kind of evidential. Um, 
brain doesn't call it an evidential, she calls it something like uh, appearance or to appear. But I think actually it's an evidential. So let's have a look. Uh, the fear is apparent. And then we see the word fear has face uh, suffixed to it and joined with the little um, nominalizing infix there. They found that the fruit was tasty. Again, find, this is the verb, and it has face suffixed to it. I already ate just now. Already, which is the word in the verb position in this sentence, again, has the face, or gu, suffix to it. And in the last one, when are you going to want this book? And want, it has face suffix to it. All of these, I think what pulls them together is that it's an evidential. We, uh, the person is asserting or questioning the reality of the event and you, you know something is true because you can see it in front of you, before your face. Uh, so that, that's my hypothesis with, with this uh, morpheme in, in car. Okay, running along. Now, in Nankauri, the word for face is different. It's cha. And cha turns up in different grammatical meanings. In Radhakrishnan, it's glossed as a dative in several sentences. So we have, he gives food to the pig. So we have that jat not, that to the pig. He gives pork to me. The last two morphemes, ja, jo, to me. So what, what's going on here? It looks like the face morpheme is being used to mark a dative. And then we have a really odd one. This gei cha fuang, go through the door where cha is glossed as through. I, I can't quite get my head around whether we can derive all these from face if they really are all the same morpheme. But I suspect that we may be able to via some kind of directional or presentational sense uh, proceeding from uh, a thing being in front of you and then to a thing moving to you or past you and then so forth. Um, any form of feedback on that I'd be really appreciative of. All right. And then the last one, I've only got a minute left. Let's run through this quickly. Um, both languages have a suffix nyi, which corresponds to their lexical word nyi, meaning house. And that's a good um, Austroasiatic word. And in this case, it means outward. So we have examples like the car, these flowers are blossoming forth, or I'm going straight out to the seashore where the nyi is suffixed to the verb. In Nankauri, similarly, I see through the window, or I had gone out to Munak. Uh, in each case, nyi is suffixed to the verb, and it means outward or southward. Um, and the southward means the same thing on the island. So that's what we're looking at. And I just wonder how we, we, we might get outward from house. This is highly speculative, so any feedback on this would be appreciated. But it seems to me lots of languages in Southeast Asia have phrases that have house in them that mean outside or rural or beyond. Phrases like Thai, Banok, Viet, Nyakwe, Malay, Luar, Bandar, where house or home or village is in the phrase that means something like out in the rural area. And maybe there was some sort of phrase like this and then one of the forms got dropped and we're just left with the word for house uh, in a fixed expression meaning meaning outside somehow. It's speculative, but any feedback on the viability of that etymology would be really appreciated uh, for discussion down the, down the road. Um, I really look forward to your, your comments and feedback now. Um, and you can also follow my existing work and follow up this, uh, the various sources um, through the links here and also on my project page, the link is here. So uh, thank you very much. I hope that was interesting and uh, 
I await your questions. Thank you.